campus of North Idaho College and today's broadcast of the North Idaho College Public Forum. The crew is comprised of North Idaho College television students. Your moderator is North Idaho College political scientist, Tony Stewart. Today our subject is job training and placement. In order to deal with this important topic, we have a very special guest, uh, Tom Jackson from New York City. Uh, Mr. Jackson, since 1977, has served as the president of Career Development Team, and since 1970, he's also been president of Employment Training Corporation, Audio Training uh, Corporation. He is one of the nation's top manpower and employment experts. His experience and achievements encompass a wide spectrum of activities with corporations, schools, and governmental agencies. In the systems area, Mr. Jackson has been responsible for the design of a variety of skills, retrieval, and manpower matching programs using online computer technology. Other systems work includes contracts with federal and state government agencies for job development and placement systems, and design of outplacement facilities for terminated employees. Mr. Jackson is the author of The Hidden Job Market, published by the New York Times, he is also author of 28 Days to a Better Job, published by Hawthorne, and Guerrilla Tactics in the Job Market, published by Bannum. He is also the author of several manuals and workbooks. It's a very special privilege to welcome you to our program. Thank you very much. I enjoy being here. I also want to welcome to join with me in questioning our guest, uh, Mary Lou Reed, a regular panelist. She holds a bachelor's degree from Mills College and did her graduate work at Columbia University in Religion. Uh, Gary Kaufman, who is the Career Development Counselor at North Idaho College, and Peggy Feggy, who is an academic counselor. Welcome, panel. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll proceed to question at once from Mary Lou Reed. Tom, you gave out the bad news today that four out of five people in our country are not satisfied with the quality of their work lives. First of all, how did you find that out, and what is the significance of that kind of a statistic? <coughs> it's very appropriate that you ask that question. I just got a letter from an article that I'd written saying that how does Jackson know that? Most of the studies show that it's much less than that, et cetera, et cetera. I had to respond to that. And the way I responded to it, saying that, in fact, most of the studies that have been done have come up with a much lower figure of work, work dissatisfaction, not a much, much higher degree of satisfaction, except that the questions that had been asked on the surveys generally were, well, how do you like your job? And implicit in that is compared to other jobs. No one really has done any survey material called, now, as regards your life, and work, which do you prefer, <laughs> you know, on work or off work? So there's not been a statistical study that supports this 80 percent. However, where I get my information is from the people themselves. So for the last 15 years, I have worked with probably 75 to 85,000 people, people who have been in firms where the jobs have, where the companies have transferred or moved and so forth and so on. And I get it from people's relationship to their work lives, their complaints, their stories, their I wish I could have something else. I need to have the job because I need the money. And so it, it's a kind of a uh, shoot from the hip figure for sure, and it definitely comes out of my experience that somewhere in the vicinity of 80% of, of the people are not looking at their job as something that gives them fulfillment. Well, why do you think this is true? What is really ma the matter with the job market today? Um, it's not the job market not the today. the job it's situation, excuse yeah, me. Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's not even that. It's that what's, why is it that people feel that work is something, a necessary evil. It's that people have separated their life from their work. You know, millennia ago, your work was your life. You got up in the morning and handled what you had to do in the world without regard to whether you called it a job or not. More recently than that, people would, all, would take their names from the work they do. Thatcher, uh, Miller, you know, Baker. They, so their work and their life were all, were, was what it was. There was no difference. You know, you know caveman didn't say, I'm going to go to work now. Um, but in recent years, in the recent century and a half, two centuries like that, work has been something you had to go off to somewhere else to do for somebody else. And that growing out of that has been this idea that I didn't choose it, I have to do it, no one told me that I could do anything differently, and so therefore I do not ch consider this as part of my life. So it comes out of the movement, of the industrial movement, I think, largely. That sets the stage. Yeah. Gary? Uh, I'm curious. Since so, f so few people seem to be satisfied with their jobs, uh, 
and with unemployment rates and a lot of other influencing things, why is so little being seem seemingly being done about it? I don't know. Um, because people tend to, the things that they do about it have tended more to be, to get more people working, not to deal more with an issue of satisfaction. The whole idea of quality of work life as even a discussable, let's say, academic topic has not come up until the mid-60s, or the early 60s, really, Frederick Hertzberg and people like that. So that it's, a, I think that a lot of where we are now about it, it came out of the 60s. People saying, well, wait a minute, I want more quality in my life. I don't care where I need to get it from, but I want more quality in my life. So, you know, how about my working life? And so the quality of work life hasn't been the issue that people have been pursuing. The people have been pursuing issues of full employment and factories working at 100% and productivity. And now I think the realization or the shift is, well, wait a minute, that's my life as well. I deserve and, and, and you know, I'm entitled to quality in my life itself. And then, of course, there are other implications that have grown out of that as well. Do you tie that in with what you described as, as the life-work revolution? Is that kind of what you were talking yes. about? Yes. <coughs> definitely what the 80s in this field, the area of people's work lives, the 80s will be about more alignment between people and the nature of the work that they do. It's a must. Productivity is down. Absenteeism is up. People don't want to work overtime. People want to avoid work. People check out early. I mean, and so in order to bring together the social and economic needs that are essential to get the, wor the world's work done and the human needs, which are to, in fact, express yourself and be yourself, what has to happen, in my view, is this what we call the work-life revolution, which is work and life have got to be b integrated. Peggy Fedger. This morning in your speech, you gave an interesting definition of a job. You said a job is an opportunity to solve a problem. And then you went on to say there's no shortage of problems, but there is a shortage of knowledge of the rules. So getting down to the practical approach to this, what are some of the rules in finding a job, a satisfying <coughs> job? Yes. Uh, you know, thank you, Peggy, for adding that last part of it. The, mm -hmm. the first thing to deal with is who are you? In other words, job search starts over here, not over there. Who are you and what are you going to do about it? You know, who are you now and what are you going to do about it? Looking inside. So step one would be to, well, wait a minute, who am I? I'm not my job title. I'm not my degree. You know, I'm not my name tag if I have a name tag. Well, who am I? And then out of that, uncover the skills, abilities, interests, different attributes. Then from there, move into a targeting a particular job that satisfies at least one element of skill and one element of your own personal interest. Kind of step one. Mm -hmm. Step two would be to look into the world and find out, well, how many people in the world are engaged in that job target? How many employers have that kind of position available, whether or not they've advertised? Stage three would be to find out what the employer would be looking for, what are the employer's needs. Stage four would be, what do I have that can contribute to the employer's needs? And stage five is, to how do I communicate that to somebody so they understand it? How do you communicate to somebody so they understand that? <coughs> you communicate it from a position that I am responsible for the communication, responsible communications. And you res communicate it by identifying the system out of which that, and I'll get slightly technical about it. Mm -hmm. uh, see, in order for me to communicate to you, I have got to be pretty clear about what it is that you're interested in. If I communicate mm -hmm. things that you're not interested in, then you're going to be off somewhere else. So first I've got to say, well, Peggy would be interested in somebody who could do such and such. So I say, well, Peggy, what I could do for you is to assist you in doing such and such. So I'm talking into the system out of which you operate rather than the system out of which I operate, which is might be I need a job. But my talking about I need a job may not even penetrate into your consciousness. Tom, you also indicated in your speech to the students at North Idaho College today that uh, if an individual has the training and, and the confidence in themselves, and has really value that they can contribute to uh, an institution or organization that they really have no problems getting a job. Uh, what do you mean by that in more detail? In other words, uh, I heard you say that uh, if the value is greater than the cost, the employer is very interested yeah. in you. Yeah, the, the universal hiring rule that applies across the board regardless of unemployment rate is that any employer will hire any individual so long as the employer is convinced that it brings more value than it costs. That's the same way you'd hire a house painter. Or somebody to you know pick your snow off your off your walk. I mean, it is literally to communicate into value and to do that so that the employer sees that that regardless of the their own economic condition within their firm, that it will be invaluable to have you there. It is a shift, and it's a very important shift, and it's what we call the work-life revolution. Is to shift it 
from waiting for jobs to kind of trickle down from the economy and from government to looking at what the little individual can do to make a contribution into the world and then to identify, well, who has a vested interest in getting that contribution, approaching them and say, look, I'm on your side. Here's what I want to get done. How can we do it together? This would result in uh, observing employees, too, would it not, in that those that you see that seem to be more secure in their jobs know that they're contributing a lot and, and they feel rather secure in their jobs, but if someone is is not really, or, or they may be costing the organization lots of money, they may feel that they're on the verge of being uh, uh, unemployed. Is sure. that correct? Sure, but if they see it from that point of view, most people don't see it from that. Most people think, well, I'm, being uh, I'm on the verge of being unemployed because my boss doesn't understand me. If mm -hmm. they saw it from the point of view that you just discussed, that I'm not contributing enough value, then clearly they would know what they next need to do in order to save their job, which is to find out how to be work be more valuable. Mm -hmm. Lou Reed. You talked a lot about I can and I can't and yes. the, the barriers to, that people have in <coughs> uh, developing the kind of confidence that is required to find the job that they want. Would you expand on that a little bit for our viewers? Yeah, um, Lou, it's about this, that in the field of counseling, for example, or in the field of communication about jobs, for years people have dealt with the rules, the content, here's the resume, here's the interviewing technique, how come you didn't do better, be brave, be courageous, be more assertive, all the imperatives. What tends to have gotten dropped out, and it still is dropped out in much counseling and in much job training, is, well, wait a minute, where are you operating from as an individual in the world? To discover that some people actually are, come from a position, well, I can't. You see, now I say that, that we have available, each of us, two contexts that we shift operating from back and forth. I can and I can't. And that, no matter, that if you're operating at a moment from I can't, no matter what I were to tell you, you would grind that up or absorb that into I can't. So if you felt, well, I can't get a good job, he doesn't know my problem, I would say the resume, the interview, you can say, well, I can't do the resume, I obviously can't do the interview. And would all, the information would be valueless to you. If, on the other hand, I could identify the part of you that operates out of, yes, I can, and say, well, yeah, here's a way to show you out of, yes, I can, how you can do that, then the information becomes valuable and you hold it. So it's, it's our job and our trainer's job and the people in the career development team as we move around the country working in these situations is to identify, constantly observe, where is the person, op where are they coming from? If they're operating out of, I can't. Instead of giving more information, start to deal with the idea of getting them to see they're operating out of I can't. Do you have exercises then that, that bring out what kind of skills they have, yes. what kind of potential? Could you describe some of, the, some of the methods that you have in your seminars and training? Yes. A basic that everybody that's viewing this program could do, I mean, right now and, and an hour from now, would be just get a sheet of paper and list, a, first of all, take two sheets of paper. One sheet list everything you like to do and list 25 things or more that you like to do. I like to go swimming. I like to work with people. I like to communicate. I like to do whatever. Take another sheet and list all the things that you can do. So it's I like and I can. List at least 25 things that I can do. I can fix machinery. I can write. You know, I can cook. I can teach. I can whatever. Take those two lists, then go over them and rank them or take the top five out of each list. So now I have five I likes, five I can's. Then just do a simple grid. Do across the top five I likes, down the side five I can'ts. Do you get what I'm saying? So there's mm -hmm. a grid, I like, I can. Write the five I likes, write the five I can't, and then look for intersections. Where does one of my things that I like to do intersect with one of the things that I can do? And put a little X in the box. And out of the possible 25 intersections, select five or six. Then for each intersection, say, now what could be uh, two or three jobs that could in fact incorporate my skill at writing and my interest in travel and then you invent jobs and then you come up with a list of 25 or 30 jobs not saying these are jobs that I want but these are jobs that relate to my skills and interests and then you move on from there. But the important thing then is the interest yes. and the skill and to try to, to bring what you already have to the job and then do you help people do you have like lists of, of jobs so they don't have to invent them Yes. Uh, are the, there books available for people who, who might be interested yes. that you recommend? Yes. Um, th there's several things to do. The Dictionary of Occupational Titles, which is available at every career center and career library and business library, lists thousands and thousands of job possibilities. There are ways of accessing that. Uh, any career planning and placement office or private counseling firm generally has some form of system of taking skills and interest 
and moving them into a job title. I actually prefer to do it without reference to any external materials, but to sit there with, let's say, six of us or five of us, sit down in a group and say, good, let's look at Lou. Lou has these five things she likes, these five things that she can do. What are some of the jobs that could exist? And out of our common knowledge of being in the world, we would come up with jobs that would probably be more appropriate than researching them in books. Do you ever suggest that that person create the job and, and start a new firm or start something yes. all by by I am, I, or himself? I actually think that what we're all involved in is career entrepreneurship. In other words, I think that from a position of responsibility, what we do is the world is our market, and what we do is look at how we can be an entrepreneur related to our career. Now, a higher level of that is that I'm, you know, I just returned from Sweden, and in Sweden it's a very, very, very uh, conservative workforce. I mean, there are certain jobs, and they get filled, and, you know, starting a new business is very difficult. But there's an incredible number of freelancers and consultants. I kept meeting and running into people saying, well, I'm a consultant. I have my own business, and I'm... Well, you know, a company of one, and they've isolated one little problem in the Swedish society, and they've made themselves an expert, and they become a consultant in that, and that's kind of an advanced form of career entrepreneurship. Create your own job. The world needs it. Ladies and gentlemen, if you've joined our program in progress, our guest is Tom Jackson from New York City. He is the president of the Career Development Team, and he is one of the nation's top manpower and employment experts. We shall continue the questioning with Gary Kaufman. It seems that, that generally the primary motivation for work is functional maintenance or the money that you earn to pay the rent, buy the food you eat, and so forth. And kind of the way you're talking, you're trying to, it seems like you're trying to realign the primary motivation to be contribution and self-satisfaction, and I'm wondering more specifically how you propose to do that. Um, thank you, Gary. It, it, it's by combining both of them. I mean, you can look at uh, Abraham Maslow's you know, a hierarchy of needs and find that the initial needs are, are physiological and then come uh, up, you know, go up the scale safety and then self-esteem and then you know, love and, and self-actualization. In fact, that's the way our work world has grown. It started out with survival needs, you know, I need money, and then it moved on to, you know, getting better communications within groups and more esteem and acknowledgement and worker awards. And it's now moving a, to a level of self-actualization, except they have to go in parallel so that if you can identify a work area that you are satisfied in and interested in and gives you pleasure, often or most often you'll find that, that also you'll do better at that. Doing better at that, you will create more value. Creating more value will make you more valuable. Making yourself more valuable means you can get more of your survival and maintenance needs maintained. If, in fact, you are willing to play it at that level. Now, a lot of people say, well, yeah, but I love this thing, it's my hobby, but I mean, no one would ever pay me for it. So they don't ever move beyond the, 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 you know, the garage or the basement workshop into the world. But when they do, I met a gentleman recently down in Tampa who, was, who had been laid off of a, a manufacturing job. He was in his early 50s and ready to give it up. And without going into the whole way that we work for this person, he discovered that what he loved to do was work with his hands and play golf. And he came out with this, with this idea of repairing golf clubs. He went to somewhere in Texas, took a six-week course in repairing golf clubs, now spends his days going around to the different professional clubs and professional uh, pro shops and all the different golf courses, and has a deal with them where he repairs golf clubs. And he gets a lot of money for it. So he was willing to charge for, that is say, have society pay him for the thing that he loved to do. So I'm saying they must be brought together. People are, by the way, not really motivated by the survival needs, they're only negatively motivated when they don't have them. It's not as generative. It's like benefits. You can add a benefit a week to these employee, to employees and they somehow don't feel any better about it. But take one away and you'll notice that it works negatively. Peggy Fetchy. In this process uh, that you mentioned a little earlier of sitting down and, and gridding your, your likes and, and your, your abilities, it seems that that would almost increase your self-concept to some di degree, to have ch actually have in front of you huge lists of things that you are able to do and to do well. When this happens, do you find that there's an increase in the person's goals or in their achievement? Absolutely. Um, we've just done a major project with 1,300, ti 1300 tire and rubber workers, blue-collar workers start out with a position, I don't have anything, I'm just a tire builder. And in this case, we didn't go right to the grid. We actually just started with pages of checklists of personal qualities. They started to check them off. And then they started to move from having checked them off to 
distilling them and writing them down. So they went from something simple like checking them off to now writing them down. And then we set them into a communication mode. So there'd be one-on-one, -on -one, well, tell me something good about yourself. So now they take what they've written down and say, well, I, I'm good at such and such. And the self-concept, I mean, just you don't even have to even know what self-concept means. Just look, at they, they would go from this to this. You know, so that their level, their, their voice level, the way they would stand, the whole thing will expand once they realize that there were things that they had there. Yeah. Something else that you talked about today, Tom, that interested me, and I, I suppose it interested me because I'm in political science, I've noticed that each decade in America it changes. The political scene of the 1950s was very, very different from the 1960s and so forth. You indicated in your speech that that was going to be true in the 1980s in, rela in relation to employment, uh, that both the employer and the employee was looking for a different um, quality of life for work. Uh, with your expertise, give us some insight into what you think the 80s will bring as far as uh, this question <coughs> is concerned. Yes. The, uh, the things that are already obvious, that are, um, Tony, that are actually now physically done uh, are things like in Japan they use the quality circles, which is to get workers to work with management and deciding on what things to do, what's working, what's not working. In Sweden they have a co-determination, which is de the democratization of the workforce. In this country, we are looking at work enrichment, restructuring the nature of the jobs so that they become, instead of one person adding a bolt to a car, a person gets to put the whole assembly together. Um, and I think where it will move to is a greater idea, this idea of career entrepreneurship, that work will no longer be looked at as a permanent affair for you with a particular employer. You won't even consider that you would be there for 20 years. I mean, it would be like unheard of, whereas a generation ago it was the norm. It, that what will happen is that people will, there will be information systems set up that people will be able to know where they're needed and wanted, where they can make a contribution. There'll be the employment security will be to be the safety net between those positions, not the place where you can go hang out for 26 weeks, you know, waiting to recuperate. That your own personal abilities, that schools, you know, who have advanced programs like right here of career planning and de development and counseling and vocational counseling will more focus from the um, placement side of it to the empowerment side of it. See, I know that when I work with somebody and the result of them is not that just that they were able to go out and get a job. I don't even care if they get a job. If they come out of there better able to handle the rest of their work life, I'm, I can leave feeling complete. So you'll, I think that empowered people, people who know how to communicate positively about themselves, know about their skills and abilities, have a resource available to plug in and find out what's available then, and have the ability to create their own way of contributing to the workforce. Lou Reed. No one has asked you yet about that rather, rather tantalizing uh, title of your book, Guerrilla Tactics in the Job Market. I think it actually follows from the, the previous <coughs> question. Perhaps you could give some background to what, what you've been doing with some of the uh, workers who uh, have been in industries that have been closed. Yes. Uh, I mean, it would it's so big that I would like to you know, have about two hours to share it and show you some of the footage that we have available on it, and it's en enormous. We are going into plants that are closing down and getting management to have our team come in, the career development team come in and work with everybody from the shop floor up into the executive suite and to run them through workshops, video trainings where they see how they communicate, give them workbooks, resumes, and to train them to be guerrilla fighters, to be individually responsible. Now they're all used to being corporately responsible and group responsible and union responsible and profession responsible, but not me, individually responsible. And we're training them that you are the center of your work life. As a matter of fact, the Swedish translation of our program in Sweden is called, you got it over there, and I don't understand it in Swedish, but it's like, like <coughs> you are the center of your work life, you know? And it's to get them to say that they are individually responsible for how it works out. And that now, they, here are the tools, rather than here's a job for you to go to, if this one doesn't work, well, come back, you know, like that. Once a person is individually responsible, they're able to take risks. Once they're able to take risk, they can enhance the degree of contribution that they can make. They can change jobs when they're no longer needed and wanted. How do you get them out of, from the point of depression to <coughs> recognizing that this is an opportunity? by, uh, very simply, Lou, by having them express their depression. We start out our workshop, particularly with hourly workers. How many people are skeptical? 
How many people think this couldn't work for them, but really mostly is for management types? Everybody raises their hand at that one. How many people uh, feel that this is a management trick to get them off of unemployment quickly to save money? Everybody <laughs> raises their hand. How many people would be realize that if you knew the rules of the work game, you'd get a job faster? Almost everybody raises their hand. They see a trap coming. How many people in here would, would be willing to have more effectiveness in their own work life? Raise their hands. Now you're very skeptical. How many people would be willing to get value out of this course? Raise their hands. Not all of them. How many people would not be willing to get value out of this course? No hands. It's to allow them to start to express <coughs> their skepticism and then take them down to a situation where they could see that they could win and the management could win at the same time. Does it move that fast and is it almost <coughs> <coughs> No, within that is, well, I think this is, a, you know, there is, uh, obviously we shortened it for television. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we also, we also uh, censored it a little bit. Mm -hmm. Gary Kaufman. It seems like a lot of these approaches are kind of like uh, symptomatic cures to the problem. Is there more of a preventative approach we can take to the problem? No, in fact, these are, these go beyond symptomatic gestures. What we discover when it works, and we're always looking at how to get what we do to work better, is that we're only interested in having the person shift the, their methodology of operating into the world or their context from I can't to I can. Then quickly reinforcing that with resumes and you know, things like that. And actually, what we have, are discovering is that people become self-generating as a result of this, so it moves beyond symptomatic. Now, as far as pre preventative is concerned, if what you mean is how do we do this without waiting for a layoff to occur, uh, yes, we are working now with companies to develop what we call work-life counseling, which is what do you do when someone's plateaued? How can you give them the opportunity to recreate their job and re-choose their job within an organization? Peggy Fadji. My question just follows along right after Gary's working with young adults, as both Gary and I do. We see a lot of students coming in wanting to prepare for a career. Um, is that realistic in any way at all anymore? No. <coughs> it's not realistic in the sense that it's used to be met. You're going to mm -hmm. prepare for a career in insurance. You're going to career, prepare for a career in medicine. Uh, what you want them to be prepared for, I believe, is to deal with this thing called their work life effectively. Now, within that, they have interim stops. I mean, the, you know, the mm -hmm. HEW has recently said that they feel that the average worker will have somewhere around three or four careers in their work life. So we can't prepare them for the career, but the ability to mm -hmm. handle the careers. And all of the I must interrupt. I'm sorry. The clock always thank lands you. on this program. I want to thank you, Tom, very much for being with us. It's been most informative. Thank you. It's an incredible question. Great panel you put together. Good panel, aren't they? Yes, absolutely. Ladies and gentlemen, our guest is, has been Tom Jackson from New York City. He is the president of the career development team, and he certainly is known as one of the top manpower and employment experts in the United States. I hope you've gotten much from our program. If you'd like to be in contact with him, please write to me, and I'll see that you get in contact with him. Please be with us again next week at the same time when, again, we'll be discussing what we believe to be an important subject. Have a good week. I am Tony Stewart. North Idaho College Public Forum can be seen at this same time each week over this station. This production was videotaped earlier by a North Idaho College student crew for viewing at this more appropriate time.